Take your Bible with me this morning and turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. I think in 30 years of preaching the gospel, I've preached out of Jeremiah one time. I preached on Jeremiah 31 about that he's loved us because he loved us. He's called us, drew us with an everlasting cords of love. But when I started thinking about this message, I, I read several different devotionals pretty much every day of my life. And I, I was reading one. I don't forgot now exactly which one of the authors I was reading that had written a devotional. But he wrote it on this particular psalm. Now, I don't want you to go to this psalm. I want to read it to you because this psalm sets up what I want to preach to you this morning. He, and the thing was, when, when I, I had read this verse before, but just never really pondered and thought and meditated upon what, what David's words were. In Psalm 40, verse 17, David declared this, I am poor and needy, yet, now listen to this, this is what, this just floored me. I'm poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Poor needy. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tearing, O oh my God. And the more I thought about it, the more overwhelmed I was to, to think that God Almighty would think on me. Me. A sinner by birth, by nature, by practice, and by choice. Now you think about it, folks. What, what it means to you and me that, that know ourselves for who and what we are, know ourselves to be sinful and evil and vile and totally unworthy in and, in and of ourselves, worthy only of the unmitigated wrath of Almighty God. And yet, that's exactly what King David says of himself here, is it not? I th This is... I am poor and needy. Now think about that. That word poor that David uses in the original means of weak, afflicted, and wretched. And that word needy means needing help. You can look at it, look all these things up for yourself. I, I never tell you just take it as it's true because I said it. Look it up for yourself. The word needy means needing help, means deliverance from trouble, especially as delivered by God. So King David, now think about who we're talking about here, King David who by earthly standards was wealthy beyond all his peers. It could honestly be said of King David that he didn't lack anything, did he? When he sinned with Bathsheba, our God told him that if, if you would ask, ask me what you will, and I'll give it to you. But he says of himself, and he says of all sinners without, and all sinners without exception, especially those chosen by God, he says what? We're poor and we're needy. He says, I am, to paraphrase what he's saying here, he's saying, I'm weak, I'm afflicted, I'm wretched, I need help. That is to say, I need deliverance from trouble, and none can deliver me but who? God Almighty. But here's the part that astonished me. In that kind of a helplessness that he felt spiritually, Feeling his need and his wretchedness and his unworthiness and his inability to deliver himself. God-given faith in that situation enables this man, this sinner, to boldly declare what? Yet the Lord thinketh on me. That words mean a lot. That, that word thinketh. It's an interesting word. And it literally means to think highly of 
are to hold in high esteem. The Lord thinketh on me. Now keep in mind, this is a messianic psalm that I'm reading to you from, Psalm 40. So first and foremost, who's this talking about? It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's talking about Him as a suffering servant of Jehovah. In, as as God-man mediator with all the sins of all the elect of all the ages charged to Him, He was indeed poor and needy, was He not? Didn't He become poor for us so that we might be made rich? But the thing you have to keep in mind, in that kind of a situation, stricken of God, smitten of God, And though men didn't esteem him, Christ declares of his Father, who, holds, who thinks of him, who esteems him, who holds him in high regard, who's well pleased with him. Who? The Father. But here's what's so important to me about that. What's said of Christ is my substitute and surety can just as surely be said of who? Me. What's his? Is my, I'm an heir of God. You too, if you believe this gospel. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus our Lord. I got ahead of myself. I quoted a verse I was going to try to read. I was going to read to you. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor. That you, through his poverty, might be made rich. So poor and needy in ourselves, yet in Christ. You know what? We're held in high esteem by the true and living God. Always view yourself the way... God views you as he is. So are we in this world. Accepted in the blood. But you know, when I continued to read that devotional and continued to read the rest of that psalm, it, it brought to my mind the passage I want to speak to you about this morning here in Jeremiah 29. Look at verse 11. Because I just could not get that thought out of my mind about God thinking on me. And I tell you, in a, in, a, in a way, verse 12 and 13 might be a good passage to come back and preach on next Sunday. Because when the Lord thinks on you, the results in verses 12 and 13. We're not going to cover that this morning. Notice what he says here. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, saith the Lord. Let this sink into your heart this morning. Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. <laughs> really, I don't even think you'd have to preach anything. You just, the word of the Lord is perfect converting a soul, is it not? First thing I'd bring before our attention this morning is whose thoughts we have brought up here. <laughs> Who's doing the thinking here? When it comes to these matters of the glory of God, you know, self-righteous, religious, sinner, they always begin with a sinner and they work backward to God. Now they do. But in reality, in this all-important matter of eternal salvation, all of it begins with God. All of it centers on God. And folks, all of it sees its completion where? In the Lord. Jonah got it right. Salvation's of the Lord in its entirety. Listen to what the Apostle John wrote. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 he says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things. What? All things. And for Thy pleasure... Let God be God, let every man be found a liar. Everything that has ever been created, it is not created for us, it's for His pleasure. They are and they were created. It's about Him, Bart. 
Ain't about us. Thank God there's some sinners that the Lord has graciously allowed to be a part of this glorious plan. But it was never about us. It was always about the great triune three one gods what this has been about. To glorify before our minds. Because he's not changed. Whatever God was before he spun this thing into existence, he always is. Not change one iota by the gloriousness of this all. He's the same. Now there's no doubt in my mind that there are many things that me and these angels can't delve into. The, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, Moses wrote. But thank God he didn't stop there, did he? And he kept writing. And he wrote this, but the things, those things which are revealed. What's revealed here? God's thoughts toward us. Those things that are revealed belong unto us. They belong to me, to you, and to our children for how long? Forever. In order to understand how important all this is to you and me as justified sinners, we have to keep in mind who Jeremiah declares are having these thoughts. Who is it? I know the thoughts that I think toward you Who's thinking it? Saith the Lord. And if you look at it in your Bible, there, and you look at this for yourself, you notice how that word Lord spelled? You notice the way the letters are? What are they? They're all capitals. Capital letter. Yeah, I, nobody ever took the time to explain anything like this to me when I was in religion. Words mean everything. Especially when we're talking about the Word of God. They, the word Lord's used all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And a lot of times, I didn't, I didn't look at exactly how many times the word Lord's used, but most of the time when you see the word Lord used, it's usually spelled with a capital L and the rest of the letters are small letters. It'll be L-O-R-D. And the word, when it's used like that, is the word Adonai. And this, here, here, let me give you an example of it. This is when, remember when Mo, uh, Abraham went out to bargain with God about saving his lot, saving Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, there in Genesis chapter 18, those angels appeared. And he fell down before them and bowed to them, one in particular. And he said, my Lord, and it's in, if you can look it up for yourself, it's L, capital L, little O-R-D, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Now that word Lord there, like I said a moment ago, it's the word Adonai. And that word Adonai means master, king, ruler of one's household. Christ is a ruler of his own house, is he not? And he was bowing to who? The Lord, his righteousness that stood before him. But in our text that we're looking at this morning, it's a capital L-O-R-D. And any time you see that four, that word, that four-letter word, L-O-R-D, it is always translated the same. And you know what it is? It's Jehovah. We, we pronounce it Jehovah, but it's actually Jehovah. And it means, look it up for yourself, the self-existing one. How's he self-existing? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In need of absolutely nothing. I, when I think about that, folk, the, you talk about Moses. Remember when he walked up to that burning bush, God said, take your feet off you on holy ground. When we're talking about Jehovah God, we're talking about any of the person of our God, whether it's Christ, Holy Spirit, or God the Father. We own holy ground, are we not? And we need, to, we need to tread carefully when we deal with these things. So the one who thinks thoughts toward us is who? It's none other than the great three-one God. Jehovah himself. The only one that possesses 
and is guided by infinite wisdom and possesses infinite power to accomplish his will and purpose. David said this, For I know that the Lord, and it's capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, is great. And that our Lord, it's there, there it's L, little O-R-D, the Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord, Jehovah, please, that did he in heaven and in earth and in the seas and in all the deep places. So who's thinking on us? Jehovah thinks on us. And here's the second thing I'd have you consider. Who's Jehovah having these thoughts toward? He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Saith the Lord. Now, these words recorded by Jeremiah, they were directed first and foremost. I know who is he talking to? National Israel. I know that. And I do not deny that. That nation that the Lord had chosen out of all the nations, not because they were a great nation or a powerful nation, they were the smallest, the weakest, the most unable to help themselves. God chose them to glorify and honor his power. God chose that nation to lead, national Israel to lead, to guide, to direct, and sustain as a nation. The, the people through whom the Lord had determined according to His own will to bring through that nation Abraham's seed, the promised deliverer, His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean the only people this promise is made to was to those pack of rebels out there that for the most part they all died in, in evil unbelief against the true and living God? Not on your life. Because we know this much. National Israel is a picture or a type or a shadow of what? The Israel of God. All God's elect in every generation. See, the scriptures make it clear that all men and women without exception, including lost and saved, who owns them? Who created them? Who sustains them? Who provides for them? The scriptures tell us that the, the Lord himself, he said this, that he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth his rain on the just and on the unjust. Paul, when he was standing there preaching on Mars Hill, he told those rebels there, he said, For in him we live and move and have our very being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are all also his offspring. Lost or saved, reprobate or elect, all of them, their life, their liberty, all that they possess, where does it come from? But here's the thing. The reality is this. One group out of that mass of humanity, one group, a sinner, they've never been loved of God. They were never chosen of God. They were never redeemed through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though everybody told us in false religious... Jesus loves everybody. He died indiscriminately for all men and women without exception. He wants more than anything else. Everybody to come to it. That's not the Christ of God, folks. Be careful what attributes you give to this God. The scriptures say this, Then will I profess unto them, I never no, I never loved. Look it up for yourself. I never loved you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. What? He never loved them. Told them in the Sunday Bible class hour, I continue to tell you, and I will tell you this till my dying breath. If God loves me now, you know how long he's loved me? Forever. And his love for me has never changed through the existence. Of, well, if that's a stupid thing to say. There's no existence of God. He's always been. He's the eternal I am. 
I can't explain that. I just know it to be so. His thoughts never change towards you or me. He says, as the Father knoweth me, loves me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for a particular people. I lay down my life for who? Sheep. He didn't say I lay down my life for the animals. And he certainly never says anywhere he laid down his life for the wolves or the goats or the tares or the foolish virgins. He did not, get this right, he did not shed one drop of blood. He did not bear one strike of God's eternal wrath for any sinner who is in hell now who will ever join that place. And to say so is to, to deny the very person and work of this one who you claim you love. Now that's just the long and the short of it. Thank God, folks, there's another group, God's elect, who were chosen by God the Father in Christ before the foundation of the world. They were loved by God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Where? In Christ before the foundation of the world. They were redeemed and justified through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. And they are born again in time by God the Holy Spirit through the proclamation of His gospel. And folks, God thinks His thoughts toward them and them alone. And He defines them by a personal pronoun here called you. I know my thoughts that I think toward you. So God's thoughts are toward who? The Israel of God. His elect. And let me say this before I move to this last point. The same Jeremiah who recorded these words concerning God's thoughts toward you is the same one who we, we read Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34. But in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, he said this, Same Lord, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, because I've loved you, always loved you, what's what he did? With loving kindness have I drawn you. You see that? But here's the third thing. I'd have you to consider the thoughts God thinketh toward the objects of his love. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. And this just blows me. Thoughts of peace. I can think of a lot of things I want to think thoughts of wrath toward me, can't you? I can think of enough just today that God could turn me into hell. If we're honest. Thoughts of peace, not evil. To give you an expected end. The word that Jeremiah uses here, translated thoughts, it means device, plan, purpose, or even better, it means this, the religious beliefs of Christians. And that word think, and I, this, this, just, this, kid, this got me this way. <laughs> I tell you, I, sometimes I wonder how these guys translated the scripture. This word think that Jeremiah uses here means to devise, uh, d to devise, uh, it means to devise, plan, charge, reckon. You know what the best translation is of it? Impute. And it's the same exact word in the same form that David used in Psalm 32 when he said, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. <laughs> now that means something now, though. I know my thoughts that I think toward you. So the Lord, by his prophet, declares, I know my device, I know my plan, I know my purpose, that I impute to my people. Reckon to be mine. Reckon. It's, it's, it's as much mine as if my, I, myself had produced it. 
The salvation of God's people is not a mere afterthought or some sort of contingency plan that Jehovah God came up with when He looked down through time and saw men sin and sinfulness. We need to understand before there was ever a sinner, before Adam ever sinned in the garden, you know what there was? There was a substitute. There was a surety. There was a representative. There was a redeemer. Before man ever fell. He was not called, is he not called the lamb slain before the very foundation of this earth? Paul wrote, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, that's regeneration, and belief of the truth. What's that? That's conversion. He wrote again, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, according as He hath chosen us where? In Him. When? Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ Jesus to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Why did you do this? To the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherein he hath made... Listen to that. He hath made us accepted in the blood. We didn't do anything to get it. That said, let me give you three things, real three thoughts God thinks toward it. One of them's a negative, two of them's positive. The first thought toward God is this, peace. I know that thoughts that I think, I, I charge to you. What, what thoughts does he charge toward me? Uh, here's the first one, peace. And you know what word it is? You ought to know this one by now. What is it? Shalom. Try and think of the verse, but it slipped my mind. Maybe I'll remember it in a minute. The word Jeremiah used here on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that Hebrew word shalom, which means completeness and soundness. What thoughts does Lord, the Lord impute or charge to you or me or reckon to be our completeness and soundness? God just can't. He can't just declare peace with sinners indiscriminately just, just because he wants to. And listen, he can't even declare peace with sinners just because of his love. We know God's love. In order for there to be peace with God, you know what has to happen? Two things have to happen. First of all, God's got to be reconciled to the sinner. But the second thing has got to happen is this. The sinner has to be reconciled to God. And the sinner, tragically, the sinner can't do either part of it. We can't reconcile God to us and we can't reconcile ourselves to God. Try as we may. This peace with God came at the expense of what? His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, therefore, having been justified by faith, what do we have? We have peace with God. Where's our peace at? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said in Colossians, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. How did he make peace? Through the blood of his cross. By him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. What believers here, believers there. Where's the peace at? It's in Christ. He told those at Ephesus, for he is our peace. <laughs> our Lord stood before his disciples and said, not as the world gives you peace. That's not the kind of peace I give you. We have perfect peace. Totally and completely. It's a promise peace. Accomplished on the behalf of all God's elect. In the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, I think this is the verse I was thinking about a moment ago. In Isaiah 32, he says this. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. And princes shall rule in judgment. 
and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Who's that talking about? Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But look down to verse 17. And the work of righteousness, not the works of righteousness, the work of righteousness, whose work is that? It's the same one that's talked about in verse 1, 2. Christ. The work of righteousness, what's the result of the work of righteousness? Shalom. Peace. Completeness. Soundness. And the effect of righteousness, if, you're, if you are complete in Him, what's the effect of that righteousness? Quietness and assurance for how long? Forever. Here's a second thought toward His people, and it's a negative. He says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and what? Not evil. Well, that's amazing. There's no doubt that every one of God's redeemed fully know and understand that if God would enter into judgment with them based on their best performance, on their best obedience, the end result would always be exactly the same. It would be condemnation. King David got it right, did he not? Lord, if thou shouldest mark mine iniquity, you charge me with my sin. Who can stand? That word translated in our text, not of evil, it's one word in the Hebrew, and it means giving pain, misery, or adversity. They tell you in religion, if you don't live right, God's going to get you. That, God ain't out to get his people. He has his people. And he does. So even though we fully deserve pain and misery and eternal condemnation and adversity for our sin, because of our being put in a place of reconciliation or peace through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? God will not deal with us according to our sins. Blessed, David said. We read it a moment ago. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not charge iniquity. King David said in another place, He hath not dealt with us after our sins. Isn't that a comforting thing? Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. They're gone. One last thing that he thinks. To give you an expected end. You know, since God's at peace with us, and since he doesn't ever think evil thoughts toward us, and seeing we're one with his son in the eyes of God's law and justice, you know what this is? This is a planned and purpose result. And I, this phrase here is so comforting this to, to give you an expected end. That word give means to, to, to bestow or to put upon one. The word uh, you and expected means to hope. It means ground to hope. Or it means things hope. It means an outcome. And that word end, you know what it means? It means at the last. At the conclusion. So let me paraphrase what he says in this last verse. He says, I know my thoughts and I think toward you thoughts of peace and not evil to bestow or to grant or to give you a hope or an expectation of all you could ever hope for or desire spiritually. That's what he's saying. Abraham was a perfect illustration of this. Let me read you this verse and we'll quit right here. Listen to you. In Romans 4 verse 16 it says this. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed and not to that only which is of the law but to that which also is of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. As it's written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they are. Listen. 
God gave, gave him a promise, a hope. What was the hope? You go out there, you can count the sand of the seashore or the stars of heaven. You can number your, your lineage. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He hadn't even had a son yet. Who against hope believed what? In hope. What was his hope? The promise of God. That he might become the father of many nations. He sends Ishmael out. Isaac's just one. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. If God says it, what is it? It's so. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was an, about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. How did he give glory to God? Being convinced that what God had promised, what's God able to do? He's able to perform. Well, he's promised us an expected end. And if he's promised it, what's going to happen? Think there's any possibility you won't get that expected in? I think God would sooner cease to be God than not do what he says. Now that's true. And I look at this real quick. Notice in that one verse, who's doing all the action here? Find you in there, anyway, other than that's that. What I've thought towards you. Show me what you've done in any of this. Bring the sinner out of it. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. These verbs, folks, they're, they're in the aorist tense. It's, a, it's an action. It's all, already occur, going to occur. And it's in the passive tense, which I'm not an English major, but I know this much. The passive tense means what? It's somebody that's being acted upon. It receives the action of the verb. Who's getting the action of the verb here? You. Who's doing the acting? Jehovah. I did salvation for God's elect vote. It's an expected in. It we we can believe him. I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And I it's an expected in, and folks, it's free from fear. It's free from anxiety and free from drama. And all the fear and all the anxiety and all the drama that we experience, you know where it comes from? It doesn't come from God. Where does it come from? It comes from us. It comes from the evil of unbelief. My prayers this morning is that the Lord will graciously grant us the faith to enter into and enjoy all these blessed promises that are in Christ Jesus. Yea and amen. He thinks thoughts of peace toward me. When, when things go bad this week, and you don't feel like things are right between you and your God, believe God's promise. What's he thinking thoughts toward you? He's not sitting there, I'm going to break you. I'm going to get you. You step one more step. Now it thoughts of peace. Completeness. Unto him who's able to keep you from falling. And present you without spot and without blemish before his throne. At his coming be all the glory forever and ever, worlds without end. Amen. Okay, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. I pray that the Lord will bless that to your understanding this morning. All, would you dismiss this, please, sir?